Let's take some time and pray together. God, we ask your blessing upon this time that we spend thinking about the scripture, thinking about how it is that we are called to be agents of your peace in the world. And we just pray your blessing upon each heart, each mind, uh, each one of us, as we listen and hear and understand, and as we think about how it is that we might uh, carry this forth into the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to warn you, uh, today, a little later in the sermon, um, you will actually be asked to answer questions. And when that happens, I'll expect you to have some kind of responses, okay? <clears throat> so just know that. I'm warning you now. Be ready. So there was a 2013 article in the Harvard Business Review uh, that started this way. Rudeness at work is rampant, and it's on the rise. And that article was entitled, The High Price of Incivility. And if you look at that article, you can still find it online. It's free to read it. Um, it's not real long. If you look at it, it uh, gives you some statistics that I find pretty depressing, to be perfectly honest. So uh, among them, the one that really stood out for me was the idea that 50% of people in every, any given week uh, report that they've been treated rudely. Uh, in the past week by somebody at work, whether a customer, or a colleague, supervisor, whatever. And um, the authors you know, go on to say that when they did the same survey back in 1988, about 15 years ago, they found that that number was only 25%. So we went from 25% 15 years ago to 50% today. You know, we doubled okay, the number of people who are facing rude people you know, in their day-to-day -day work life. And the authors of this article, being in Harvard Business Review, right, they argue that it's bad business, because what it adds up to is it adds up to workers who are less committed to the organization. It adds up to workers who sometimes take out their frustrations on the customer, right, which you probably have all experienced, all of us have. Uh, you find that workers are less productive because they spend a lot of their try time trying to engineer ways around having to deal with certain people because they just rub them the wrong way. Or, you know, at the most extreme, people just decide, you know what, I'm not dealing with this, I'm gonna quit. And so they give up, and then you're faced with the cost of retraining. But it's not just bad, you know, for business. It's bad for us as human beings. Our studies, other studies that have been done have shown that uh, when you poll people, poll Americans about how are things going, do you feel like people, you know, in general are becoming more rude, less rude, you know, 75% of us agree that people are becoming ruder as time goes on. And the place where I notice that the most is on the road, right? So here's typical, you know, this, this is the one that really strikes me as something that I feel is relatively new in the past several years. Um, when I'm stopped at a light and I start going, especially if I'm maybe the first person in line and there wasn't really a line behind me before, the person who comes up behind me sees that I'm just getting started, and so they pass by me on the right, you know, in the midst of the intersection, right? You've had that happen? Um, or, let's say I'm going to visit somebody, you know, frequently, you know, you're a pastor, you're driving around, you don't know exactly where you're going, and so you slow down, you're looking at mailboxes, or looking at house numbers, whatever it is, and so people will try to pass you, either on the right or on the left, and you're hoping that maybe you're not turning at the same moment, either to the left or to the right. Actually, some people take it to great extremes. A couple of years ago, Stephanie was stopped at a light near our house, and somebody actually tapped her, like, to say, get moving, right? And that's a really frightening thing, right? Because you never know what, like, what is that about, right? That's pretty aggressive. I mean, really aggressive. So uh, we started this series with my comment about ordering a hoagie at Wawa, right? And about how depersonalized, dehumanized, that whole process had become. And you know, when you take a look at all these anecdotal things that we experience every day, and then you add it, you layer over it, you know, the data that we have from these different polling organizations, what you start to see is this uh, pretty compelling picture of how we have a world that really is starving for people who understand and know how to build community. That's what I see. We need people who understand what it means to bring people together because they feel very disconnected. And I was thinking uh, last night in terms of three A's. You know, alienation, 
anger and anxiety really is kind of the summary of where we are, alienation, anger, and anxiety. That's kind of what we're dealing with. And so one very specific way that Christians can be salt and light in the places where we go is really to take our experience of community here and our understanding of community in the church and carry it out into the world, to bring Christ's peace into places where we don't necessarily expect to find Jesus, but where Jesus is nonetheless. And I believe that that was a major part of what's being described as the ministry of the disciples in this passage that we're reading. So we think about 12 disciples usually, but in this passage we talk about 70 or 72 who are being sent out two by two. And I love this phrase. Jesus is sending them to all the places where he himself intends to go, right? So in other words, the idea being that it's not like Jesus is sending you out there by yourself, but Jesus is sending you out there into those places where he himself intends to go. And I like to think about that. And as he sends them forth, he gives them instructions. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, let people know that the reason why these things are happening, why people are being healed, is because God has drawn near to you. The kingdom of God has come. But he gives them a very specific instruction around what to do when you get into a place. So you get into somebody's house, and if somebody is welcoming you into their home, the first thing that you say is what? Peace. Peace to this house. It's the first thing that you say. Peace to this house. Just a very, very simple blessing. Four words. But behind that four-word blessing is something that's so tangible. It's like so solid. It's so palpable that Jesus goes on to describe it as if there's someone there who shares in that peace, that peace will rest on them. It's almost like something that you put on. It's like something that you're wearing. It's that tangible. It's that real. Peace will rest on them. And so I want you to think about this idea that there is a, a place, a people, a community, a peace that is so real, that is so tangible, that you immediately know it when you see it. And I want you to think about, just for a minute, think about places in your life, people, groups that you're with, communities that you're a part of, where you feel that, where you go and you just feel good. You feel like, wow, this is how people are supposed to be with each other. I hope that there's places in your life like that. I hope that this is one of those places. And I'm wondering if there are others. Just think about that for a moment. I want you then to contrast that. There are probably some places in your life where you walk, walk in and it's not necessarily like that. It doesn't feel that way. And you know that as soon as you walk in the door almost, you can feel it. Again, it's palpable, it's real, you can almost touch it. The fact that, wow, there is not peace here. And so, the mission that Jesus gave us is to build communities where people can have this sense of peace, where they can live in a sense of grace and forgiveness and love for each other that is real and palpable and just, you can't escape it and you can't deny it. Over the last couple of weeks, we were talking about the church as that kind of place, and that should be kind of a no-brainer, this idea that, of course, if the church is not that kind of place, then, well, then we really have some trouble, right? So that makes sense. But today I want us to think a little bit more about the idea that, well, it's not just the church though, for Christians, it's not just the church that's called to be that place. It's, we're called to bring that same sense of peace out into the places where we go, wherever they are. So I want us to think about that. And that's especially important for leaders of all different kinds. And so uh, when I talk about leaders, you know, you, we can use that term in the broadest possible sense. You might be a leader in some kind of volunteer organization that you're with, um, maybe you're a coach. Uh, of your kid's team, whatever it is. Maybe you are a leader in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. Uh, maybe you are a boss at work. Maybe you own your own company. Um, whatever it is, you know, I feel like part of the task of leadership is to be that presence that sets the tone for everything else that happens. And I think that's true whether we're talking about a church, whether we're talking about, you know, Fortune 500 company, whether we're talking about the United States. Whatever it is, it's important that we set the tone. And uh, I get this idea, there's one idea that I really like from 
a rabbi who did a lot of writing in the area of uh, what we call family systems theory. And he talked about how uh, relationships within families kind of carry over into all the other organizations that we're part of. And one of the things that he says in his books is that leadership is therapeutic. In other words, simply by being a good leader, somebody who cares, somebody who listens, somebody who pays attention, that in and of itself can be healing for people. And I believe that's true. And I try to think about that. You know, and so if you're a mom or a dad, you think about yourself as a leader within your family. Right? There are lots of different ways to think about leadership. And in a little while, we'll talk about how, you know, you don't have to be uh, a leader on paper to end up being a leader by what you do. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But I wanted to see if uh, we could maybe have a little conversation around this. And I wanted to be really practical here. We actually have a couple of people with microphones, or at least one person with microphone, um, that'll come around. And uh, here's my question to you. How have you seen this practice of carrying Christ's peace out into the world, out into an organization? How have you seen it work? How have you seen it done? What are some concrete things that you think about doing in order to build that kind of a sense of peace among people? All right? So let's try it. Let's go. Someone? Ask for people's opinions. All right. So in other words, you collaborate with people. Good, Jeff. Thank you. Doing community cleanups. Okay. So working with people just to beautify something. Yep, civic pride. Absolutely, pride in, in the area that you live. That's good. When you go into a place of business, give yourself as a friendly person with a warm hello and okay. how are you. Yep. Even on the phone, say hello, how are you? Don't just conduct business, but be friendly. Absolutely. So you, so you make it a point, just something as simple as saying hello, smiling, how are you doing? Good. Just helping your neighbors. Okay. Working with your neighbors, helping them. What else? Behind? Good. We have a person at work who listens to everybody. Okay. You mean aside from you? Oh, no. Because I can see you doing that. She's much better than me. Okay. People are drawn to her because she listens. She's a strong person. Okay. So to be able to be a listener, right? And I would say, you know, to follow that up, the idea of listening and knowing what's going on with the people around you, and then uh, not only saying that you're, gonna, that you're gonna be in prayer about that, but actually praying with them about it when they're open to it, or, you know, even if that opportunity is not available, then to just go off and, and pray for them, right? To, to practice acceptance first, and, and not um, just rejection, All right. as, as your first way of even knowing anyone. Okay. To begin with an, accept, an attitude of accepting people. Yeah, Chris. Um, be one who brainstorms solutions instead of just talks about problems. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, be proactive in trying to figure out solutions. Kendall. Uh, get everyone involved. Okay, bring everybody, bring everybody into the fold. And I think that that's an important thing, especially if somebody you know, on, in the group or on the team is a little bit quiet, you've got to engage them. Uh, maybe if somebody feels different uh, and feels maybe like they don't belong to really engage them. <clears throat> And especially when, uh, and I just had this experience, we had a lot of uh, people at the convocation where we were recently with the bishop and all the clergy get together. It's like a training event, but it's also a retreat event. We have a number of, of our clergy uh, and clergy couples who have babies. And so these babies were you know, in the room and everybody's holding these babies. And just the idea of including everybody of all ages was a great thing. Wayne. Recognizing a need and responding to it without being asked. Okay, so being proactive, again, being proactive about taking responsibility to fix something when you see it. That's good. Others? Yep, Ann? <laughs> Pointing out the positive, especially very specific yeah. pod positive things that people bring to a situation. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of, instead of being, make sure that the, you say you know, 10 positive things for the one negative thing that you have to say. That's right. No, um, so all oh, this is good. Does anybody else have any more? Yeah, you know, there's just a couple other ones that I'm thinking about. You know, taking the time to know names. You know, that one to me is important. I try to work at that. I and mean, it is something that you have to work at sometimes. Um, but that's an important one. Um, there's this uh, idea that comes from a Jewish scholar, Emmanuel Levinas. He talks about the idea, uh, 
and this kind of deals with not only giving somebody a name, but kind of giving them a, an identity. Um, Levinas says that the, the ethical compact between humans, okay, is what he says. This is technical language now. But his point is, people don't start to act like human beings until you see their faces. You can do anything you want to somebody when you can't see them. But as soon as you can see them, something changes, right? And so there's that idea as well. And I think that knowing somebody's name is really important. Actually, that's a whole ministry that happens at Auschwitz. Um, I just heard about that this week in conjunction with the anniversary. There are people who are dedicated, archivists, and this is the most exciting thing that they can do. Their records are all based on people's numbers. When they can find the name that went with that number and kind of connect a family to, yes, here's your loved one, here's kind of their origin, where they came from, when they can do that, that is a really good day for them. Give somebody back their humanity, that idea. Um, so I think that all this is really good. I would say, you know, to, next week we're going to talk a little bit about the practice of hospitality, and especially here in the church. So that's, a, that's an important thing. Even offering someone a cold drink of water or a cup of coffee, whatever it is that you have, that makes a huge difference. Um, and sharing a meal together. Uh, that's, isn't that what we do when we celebrate communion? Right in the early church, now we, have, we celebrate this kind of very ritualized version of a meal. But... In the early church, that really was simply a kind of a potluck. You know, everybody brought something, you had a meal together, and you remembered how Jesus has had this meal with his disciples on the night before he went to the cross. So that's important to me. So all of this sounds like church, right? I mean, all the things that we're talking about sounds, they should sound familiar because they sound like the things that we do here in the church. Because whenever we're in the church, we have the luxury, we have a community that's been built around Jesus, right? So it makes sense for us to do all the things that he did, but sometimes we forget then to do those same things out in the world. I mean, that's the, our challenge. You know, the reality is there are places where Jesus doesn't really seem to be welcome, okay, in our everyday lives. But you know what? Jesus kind of sneaks in the back door, even when he's not invited. That's his deal. That's what he can do if we're willing to invite him in, even if we're not able to use the words. Even if that community is not really formed around Jesus, we can still invite Jesus in. So there's a great story in the New Testament about um, how the disciples are kind of holed up and they're locked away. So this is the Doubting Thomas story from John. They're locked away, they're hiding out, they're afraid. And what happens? Jesus suddenly walks through the wall and kind of joins them, right? So this idea that even if Jesus is uninvited, he will show up if we invite ourselves. Even if nobody else is interested in having him there, if we're interested in having them there, he will show up. So I wanna wrap up with this one last illustration. And here's an example of someone who uh, took a very small thing and made a huge difference. So do we have that video ready to go, guys? Perfect. From what I understand, his father passed away, and he would have pictures of him in his locker. Some students thought it would be a good idea to rip down those pictures and harass him and bully him for missing and loving his father. No one wants to be bullied. Everyone wants to feel like they mean something to somebody. It's definitely a hard four years of your life, you know? Even like a few words can affect someone so negatively. I'd sit in the cafeteria alone. I wouldn't talk to anyone. Even if people invited me to sit with them, I didn't feel this was my place to be. Yeah, I just wanted to make it and just be a normal kid. I was sick and tired of being a no one. I wanted to be someone and wanted to reach out to people and show who I was. I just remember at first they called him the doorman. They thought he was weird. It was definitely kind of weird. It took a while for people to adjust. But once people realized that he was continuing with it, it almost became something to look forward to in the morning. Like, you walk up the stairs and you know that Josh Ann's going to be standing there with a big smile on his face saying good morning. No problem. The first few weeks when I started doing it, 
They were kind of shocked. Good, you? Thank you. Not many people hold doors, right? But after that, people started to open up to me. Opening a door is more than a physical act. It's about like putting yourself out there, getting to know people, making them feel comfortable, making them feel welcome. Thank you. No problem. Opening doors, it gives people hope that people care. It was definitely a positive effect. Like it made people want to do nice things for other people. Like it was, he set a good example for other students. Everything changed huge. I mean, everyone said it. All the teachers, the students felt it. They they talked about it. You know, that he he changed things in the school. I never expected to get an award or anything like that. I guess I, I was just happy enough to make it through. Just one year and things are, are totally turned around, totally. It's amazing how um, just one simple act can change your whole life. I never thought doing something so simple could be so rewarding. So Josh decided that the best way to open doors was literally to open doors, right? And so if you think about it, as people are going in and out, and he's saying, have a good day, it's nice to see you, that's a blessing that he's pronouncing on each person. You know, it's kind of a secular blessing, but it's a blessing nonetheless. And each one of those interactions doesn't really mean much. It's kind of eminently forgettable. You know, each individual thing, who would not remember somebody saying, hey, have a good day? But when they're kind of stacked on top of each other, and sustained over a period of time, then you know what? It was transformative for the culture of that school. It was transformative for Josh himself to be able to do that. And so I want us to think about as we go out into the world, the things that we can do to bring Christ's peace into the places where we go, among the people that we serve, among you know, the communities that we interact with, it's a really simple thing that Jesus taught his disciples to do, to say, peace to this house. But it meant a transformative kind of new way of being. So this week, I want you to think about what's one thing that you can do? What's one thing that you're willing to take on? It doesn't have to be a big thing. It's something that will bring the peace of Christ to those whom you see and interact with every day. Amen.